we shall start with a review of the previous lecture, lecture number seven, and um, then continue on. Um, and today we'll introduce the concept of sequential logic circuits. And this will be compared with um, combinational logic circuits, which we have studied uh, so far. Uh, we will then go on to looking at computer architectures and uh, looking at addressing uh, how the memory is organized, your dynamic RAM memory in your, in your computers, and looking at a possible, if you have time, how a, a computer program is actually executed at a very low level. Okay, and we look at an example from the book. So um, this is a review of the previous lecture. Uh, we spoke about uh, the three-bit address and we looked at the truth table and then we looked at how you could actually implement this uh, in using gates. And we introduced the concept of a Boolean algebra and Carnot maps. And we looked at how Carnot, Carnot maps can be used in order to uh, simplify uh, Boolean expressions. And then from the Boolean expression, yeah. one could actually construct a circuit, a logic circuit uh, comprising of different types of gates, such as AND gates, OR gates, NOR gates, NAND gates, and so on. Uh, we looked at the example of the three-bit adder and the different logic circuits for both the, the sum and the carry out. And then we compared it uh, at the end to um, a, a more professional, um, uh, logic diagram, which is generally available uh, and is actually used. And we saw that uh, there is a correlation between what we saw and the, the gates that we, the circuit that we made and the circuit that was uh, generally available. What we've been looking at, the kinds of logic circuits so far are called combinational circuits. And to be able to differentiate uh, a uh, with that with sequential circuits, first we have to understand what sequential circuits are, and then you'll be able to understand the difference with, with combinational circuits. So let's take a look at a first example of a sequential circuit. And uh, this is referred to as a flip-flop circuit, okay? Um, and hopefully the, the term will make sense as we go through this logic. So let's start with uh, certain assumptions. Uh, we're going to be looking at it over time, how this circuit behaves at, over time. And we'll start by looking at uh, certain values. For example, we'll start by assuming that A is initially zero and B is also zero, okay? And let's try to figure out what uh, the output X will uh, be, if this is the case, okay? And I'd like people to uh, tell me how this will operate. So. Somebody from class 5779, please tell me uh, what should be the output over here. Now, what gate is this? Somebody from uh, class- Tarek, you bar, bar gate. Uh, Tarek, okay, you're in 5779. Okay, so this yes, is an sir. OR gate. Uh, and what should be the output over here? Not sure, sir. Okay. One. Well, uh, it's an OR gate, so it would depend on both the values, right? So we not only need to know what A0 is, but what is the value over here, okay? So now let's try to backtrace over here. Now, if this is a zero, what should be the output over here? This is clearly a one because this is a NOT gate, all right? Uh, this is an AND gate. So what should be the output over here? Let's call this uh, y. So what would be the value of y? Uh, sir, it, depend, uh, Tariq, it depends on what the value, whether the value of the OR gate is one or zero, right? Yeah, yeah. So you can see that it's not clear what the value of y is going to be uh, because we don't know what the value of x is, okay? So they sort of, they're in the interdependent. And so we really don't know what this value is going to be because this is an AND gate. And if this is a one, if this was a zero, the output would be a zero, but if this was a one, the output would be a one. So, so we don't know what this value is. So we don't know what this value is since we don't know what this is, we don't know what this is. So there is a circular problem. And the reason is that because there's a feedback going on, okay? The output is 
being fed back into the input. And so far, the, every circuit that we've seen, uh, the output is never fed back into the input, okay? And so these kind of circuits are referred to, the previous circuits are referred to as combinational circuits uh, simply because uh, they don't have any memory, okay? And they simply depend on the input. But sequential circuits have what is referred to as memory, okay? Because it depends on the past values. So let's say that we don't know what the value of X is. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a step forward and at time a little bit later, we, at time one, we're going to set A value to be one. Okay, so we're going to change this to a one. We're going to let B is equal to zero. So now what should be the output? Okay, so let's remove all of this. Can somebody else uh, tell me what the output will be? Um, sorry, G, go ahead. Let's see once. Let's see is answering that this should be one. Okay. Uh, why is that? Simply because this is an OR gate, right? And an OR gate, uh, if, the, if one of the inputs is a one, the output is definitely going to be a one. So we know that the input to this AND gate uh, is a one. Uh, the B value is zero, so the so the, this output over here is a one. These two are one, so the output over here is a one, and so um, this is, seems to be stable. Okay, so both of these inputs are going to be one. The output is going to be a one. So uh, this is clearly now, and the output is now a one. Okay. Now at time two, a little bit later, what I'm doing is I'm going to set the value of A back to zero. Okay, so now I'm changing this back to zero. Now, can somebody tell me what should be the output of X? Uh, Tariq from 5779, I think everything will be zero, right? Including X. Okay, so um, why is that? Can you give me the logic behind that, Tariq? Um, because sir, uh, a zero and uh, a zero and although b should be one after going through the NOR gate, when it goes through the AND gate, it will be zero. So the x output will be zero. Sir, Omar, am I there? Sir, Akif. Omar, G. Omar uh, or Omar. Sir, the output should be one as the memory stored in the uh, sequential logic is previously one. So the output should be one passing through the AND gate and then overall x value would be one. Okay. So what Omar said uh, seems to make a lot of sense. Basically what he's saying is that there is some memory. So notice that we are going over time. So I'm showing here the time uh, scale over here. And so let's try to see what's happening in time. So initially everything was a zero. Uh, this is A, this is B, and this is X. Uh, this was B was zero, A was zero. We didn't know what X was. We made A equal to one and that forced the output to be also equal to one, okay, uh, right? So this was stage at time is equal to zero and then time one. Now at time two, what we did was we made um, A equal to zero, okay? So now when A becomes zero, um, it's still a one. Okay? If this is still a one, then because this is an OR gate, this will continue to be, the X value is going to continue to be a one, okay? If this is going to continue to be a one, these two are ones, uh, B is a zero, this will continue to be a one. And so this is a stable situation. You can see that this one will not change. And so the output will continue to be a one. Does everybody follow that? Any questions? So kindly repeat it. Okay. So let me repeat it. Basically what happened was initially we made A go to one. Okay. And that forced the output to be equal to one. So I can show this by a line over here. This is forcing the output to be go to up to one. But then when A goes back to zero, okay. The, the reason why X will continue to be one is because one of the inputs now is one. 
And the OR gate, if any one of the inputs is a one, the output will be a one. So this will continue to be a one. And the question is, is this a stable one? Well, this is, uh, all, this is going to feed back into the AND gate. These two are going to feed back into the AND gate, okay? And since both of these are one, the output of the AND gate is also going to be a one. So this one will persist, this will not change. If this one persists, then the output will continue to be a one because this is an OR gate, okay? So hopefully if you still don't follow this, just go through this logic a few times yourself or rewind the lecture later on and try to see if you can follow this logic. So what we've seen now is that even though initially both of these were zero, the output was unpredictable, but here after A has become one and then goes to zero, the output is going to retain to be a one. Now the output is not unknown as earlier, but it is definitely a one. Now, okay, simply because A sort of turned it into a one. Okay, by making A go to one, the output has been forced to be a one. And when A goes back to being a zero, so this state over here, this state here is different from this state, even though both the inputs are the same. Okay, so at time zero, both the inputs were also zero, but uh, at time two, the, both the inputs are still zero, but because A was went up to one and then came back to zero, so the output now is definitely a zero. We, it's not an unknown, it's a clearly a one. Now let's keep going on. Uh, let's go to time three. At time three, I'm going to make B equal to one. Okay, so A is going to continue to be a zero and I'm going to make, make B equal to one. Okay, so now uh, let's just uh, remove some of these additional marks. And now uh, A is continuing to be a zero. This was already a one. Okay, and now I'm making B equal to a one. Okay, now can somebody tell me what the what will happen? Sir, Heather said fine. G Heather. Uh, if B is one, then the output from the NOT gate will be zero. Yeah. Uh, and previously, the AND gate from X that was one, so zero AND one, so zero will be the output. Yeah. Zero AND one, so zero, and then the output will be zero. The output will be a zero. Now don't stop over here, continue with the logic. What impact does this have over here? It brings it down to zero and zero and zero is also zero. So, it's okay. still so you can see that this intermediate value over here is now stable. It's stable at zero, okay? And so the output is not going to change. And the so now the output has essentially been forced to become a zero, okay? So by basically making B equal to a one, all right? and A is continuing to be a zero. This is forcing the output to go down to a one, uh, sorry, to go down to a zero. Okay, so you see how the input is having an impact on, on the output. But now let's go back again to this uh, stage, which was reflected in stage zero and state two. In state four, I'm going to make B again a zero, okay? Now, can somebody tell me what's going to happen? Somebody from 5779. Sir, Zerlesh. So now B is zero, so uh, output will be one, and then this one will go to the AND gate and uh, the other output is zero. So the, on the output from the AND gate will be zero. Then zero and A is zero, the output will be zero. The zero will again go to the AND gate and uh, then go towards the OR gate and answer will be zero. Okay, the very good. So, so the output will continue to be a zero. Okay. So even though now you see three situations, okay? You see this situation over here? There are three situations when both the inputs are zero. Situation was at time zero, they were both zero. Both of these values were zero. At time two, both of these values were zero. And at time four, both of these values were zero, okay? But the output is very different in each case. Here, the output was unknown because we didn't know what was the earlier, uh, you know, what was what happened at time t minus one. but what happened at time t is equal to one 
had an impact on the output, converted it to a one, okay? And um, I converted it into a one, and this continued to be a one, even though the inputs became zero, okay? Now the out, when B became a one, that forced the output to become a zero. And then when B returned back to being a zero, the output continued to be a zero. So what have you noticed over here? Can somebody tell me what's going on? What's the logic of this entire circuit? And how are the inputs controlling the output? And how is this different from the combination logic that we saw earlier? Can somebody try to explain what's going on? Sir, Omar, am I there? Jumar. Sir, basically sequential circuits I, I have some type of inherent of memory, which uh, it works on and it's uh, also known as bi-stable uh, circuits. So until a next clock signal changes a previous stored element in the memory, the circuit will remain working the same. Okay, very good. So you use, you're using terms which haven't been introduced, which is fine, but um, I would like people to explain from, you know, just the facts that have been explained. I haven't used what is a clock cycle so far, okay? Uh, I haven't used uh, terms such as bi-stables yet. So just based on the concepts that we've introduced right now, I would like people to explain it. Uh, somebody who's, um, somebody else perhaps. Uh, and if possible, somebody else could also try to attempt. Basically, I think we've, uh, we've got a reasonable explanation. As you can see, essentially what we have is a memory, as was also mentioned earlier. So this circuit has a memory and the memory depends on these two inputs, okay? So you can think of it in this way, that if A goes up, if A and B are both normally zero, okay? But if A goes up to one, then it forces the output to zero. Uh, sorry, it forces the output to a one, okay? And then if B goes up to one, then it forces the output to a zero, okay? So you can think of it this as a very useful circuit and the circuit will retain its memory, okay? So even after the, output, the inputs have gone back to zero, the circuit will retain its memory. So for example, over here, when A went back to zero, the output continued to be a one and it would have re remained to be a one for as long as the inputs didn't change. But if B turned it, but if B became a one, then it would force the output to be a zero. Okay, so you can see that this is essentially what is called a flip-flop circuit. In other words, it's flipping, flopping, if that's a term, it's, uh, it's changing the output from uh, one value to another, depending on which signal was last used to change the, sig change the output. Okay. Um, Ji Nadal. Sir, how is the circuit retaining the values? Okay, so, so think about it again over here. Um, so let me try to repeat some of it and see how it's retaining the values. Okay, so we go back over here to the situation where this was zero, this was zero. Okay, and let's assume that uh, the previous value was a zero. Okay, so this is, let's say that you were over here, that you're over here in state four, and all three of these are now zero. Okay, so this is going to be a one, one, and this is going to be a zero. As a result, this is going to be a zero, and this is uh, a stable situation. Okay, now, so this is state five. Sorry, this is state four. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to again force A to be a one. Okay. So, um, well, let's not use A is equal to one. Um, yeah, that's a good, uh, I think that let's use that. So let's change this to a one. Okay. And we already saw that, that this would become a one, this would become a one, and both of these are one. So the output would become a one and this would be a one. And so this would be a stable situation. Now, even after you go, this turns back to a zero, now you can see that it retains its value, okay? You can see that in stage two, the output is not going to change, okay? So essentially what you've done is by, by 
using this sing this short command, this could be for a very short period, we've been able to make the output convert to an uh, a one, and it's now it's essentially written in a sense in memory. Okay. So as long as um, the entire circuit is not changed, it continues to have power. Remember that each one of these circuits needs to have power. If you go back to your earlier transistor circuits, a NOT gate needs to have plus five volts and so on. So as long as power is still there, this, me this um, memory will be retained, okay? So um, is that clear? So this yes, value sir. over here, is going to be retained. The output is going to be retained regardless of whether the input has now changed back to a zero. Okay. Is that um, somewhat clear? Yes. Sir. Okay. G. Sir, Batul, I have a question. G, sir, G, sir if we, for uh, OR or AND gate, if we put only one input, so then can it give an outcome? If you only put one input, uh, how do you mean? Can you give me an exact example? Like as you started here, A uh, equals to zero, B equals to zero. Now here for OR gate, uh, there are there we need two inputs. Yeah, zero and the second one is not clear now. So how can it give output? Yeah, so, okay. So let's assume that we've started, we've restarted this um, entire memory, okay? We've just turned it on. And so the initial question is what, and I think it's a deeper question that has been asked is, what is actually going to be the value of this, okay? So let's say we don't know what happened before, okay? We've just restarted the circuit and this is zero and this is zero. And so this has to have some value, okay? And what value is it going to be? So this is an interesting question. Um, let's, say we do, um, let's say we've just re restarted the circuit. So what do you think is actually going to happen? It, it, it can't, it can't be in a state of limbo, you know? It, it has to have either zero value or one value. The question is, what will it be? Uh, sort of a, a deeper question that's been asked, I suppose. Any thoughts? Sir, Fawaz here. Uh, Fawaz. I think it's gonna be a zero when there's no voltage. Okay. No, uh, you just turned it on. So you, you've you turned, the, you've just powered up, you know, you, let's say you have a hardware circuit, you just powered it on and it has this circuit built in, okay? Uh, you uh, sir, you Tarek. force, G Tarek. Shouldn't it be zero because there hasn't been a previous iteration. There, there, there shouldn't be a value saved in the memory, right? Because we just turned it on. Okay, so um, let me answer this question by saying that it's really not clear, okay? It's going to have one of the two values, and it will depend on, um, you know, the actual circuitry on the hardware. And it's hard to say which value will it be, okay? Unless you actually look at the hardware circuitry, and this will go all the way back into, you remember your initial transistor circuit, where uh, you you actually were providing at five volts and so on. So you'd have to go down to that level to be able to figure out whether this, there will be a default value, which will be either a zero or one. I really don't know, unless I do that exercise, okay? And um, it, it actually, and, it, and it's also possible that depending um, that at, if you turn it on uh, at different times, it may actually have different values, okay? And that may actually depend on some random behavior uh, in the circuitry, okay? So voltages, uh, depending on um, you know uh, various phenomena inside circuits, um, it may actually come out to um, have either a zero at some times and one at at different times. Okay, unless your circuitry forces it to have a certain value, the default value may be unknown. Okay, but the default value will be one of the two, zero or one, but it may be unpredictable and may have different values. So that's not a good circuit. Okay, so if your circuit output is, um, is in that situation, it is better to actually initialize the, the system. Okay, and that's why uh, when, I, when I told you about when we were doing pro, uh, Python programming, um, I said that variables have to be initialized, right? If you don't initialize a variable, it will take the value from the memory 
and the value in the memory is maybe random. Okay, so when you turn your computer on, uh, some of the, the DRAM values may be random. Okay, and so when you want to make sure that your value of a variable, let's say X is equal to one, you have to initialize it. Don't assume that it will be zero or uh, it will have a certain value. Okay, so that was a slightly deeper uh, question and um, we, uh, I don't want to go into the exact answer because that would require us going more into the hardware level. Okay. So but let's Tumar, can I ask a question? But, uh -huh, yes, but let's try to make sure that we understand uh, what happens once uh, certain uh, things are executed, okay? So once A becomes a one, then the output is definitely going to be a one in these situations. So everything onwards from here is predictable. This portion will be unknown, okay? At this time will be unknown. Uh, there was a question, G. Sir, do we choose the inputs by ourselves and not yes. it is yeah. already given. Yeah. So, so I'm going to be assuming that the inputs are going to be determined, okay? So you're providing it inputs and you're observing the behavior of the circuit as you change the inputs, okay? So we, we're providing A and B, X is the output and things in the middle, uh, this value Y is unknown and it depends on uh, you know the, the way the hardware was turned on, okay? All right, so G, um, question. Sir, I have a question. So can we say that we're just simply setting and resetting the values? Yeah, yeah, very good. So that's a simple way of saying, that's basically what the flip-flop circuit is doing. That A is setting the value, okay? By A going to a one, it's setting the value of the output to be a one, and B uh, is resetting the value to a zero. Okay, so very well put. Uh, that's a simple way to say what this flip thought circuit actually does. Okay, sets resets, and there you will see um, various different versions of a flip flop circuit. But this basically all of these what they're doing is they're basically writing to the memory. Okay, they're sim they're what they're doing is they're sim simply writing one bit into the memory. Uh, this was basically the circuit that I just showed you. Okay, so A going up. As far as the output to be a one, this is essentially, as earlier said, this is setting the output. And when B goes up, it resets it, okay? Or forces it to be a zero. Now you might ask, and I'll leave this to you uh, for further discussion, what happens when both of them go one? Okay, I'm not going to go into that right now because you can follow that up. And maybe that uh, we can discuss that after you've, you've explored the circuit a little bit more, okay? So now uh, let's go beyond this. And um, now we've, if you look at what we've done so far is that we have seen how transistors can be used to form logic gates, okay? And specifically we saw how a transistor circuit can be used to form a NOT gate. We didn't look at how AND gates and other more complex gates are formed, but we saw a simple uh, transistor circuit. Then uh, we saw how logic gates can be combined to form a combinational circuit that you saw earlier, for example, the uh, two-bit adder or full adder, and sequential circuits, which also have memory, okay? So um, this is what we've seen so far. And now the next thing that we want to do is to see how these circuits can now be combined together into the architecture to form complete computers, okay? So, um, and this is essentially going up the abstraction there, okay? So we went from algorithms, which was uh, very high up in the abstraction there. We jumped all the way down to transistors uh, and then slowly we're moving back up and now we're going into the somewhat in the middle layer where we're trying to understand the architecture of computers, okay? So uh, if you look at uh, broadly what a computer architecture is, uh, it's got, uh, I'm introducing three components over here. Uh, something called a central processing unit, CPU, okay, which we saw earlier as well uh, when we looked at the zooming under the hood. Uh, we're going to look at the main memory um, or what is also called the DRAM, okay, dynamic, random access memory. And what we're going to look at is something called a bus which connects the CPU and the main memory, okay? So if you remember these uh, uh, pictures from the previous lectures, 
the CPU is essentially one of these things, which perhaps you're familiar with, which may be an Intel CPU, uh, and uh, it goes right here onto the motherboard. Uh, the RAM that we're looking at uh, over here, the DRAM, uh, it looks something like this, and it also goes onto the motherboard. So these, this is a close-up view that we saw of the motherboard earlier. Um, this is where the, um, the CPU goes in. This is, um, it sits over here on the CPU socket. And then there are, uh, there's memory sockets. Okay, so these slots over here, this is where the memories fit in. And this is what a typical memory card looks like. So it sort of slides into, um, into one of these slots over here. And then the bus is something over here. Okay, on the actual, what is referred to as the back plane. Okay, so the bus interconnects the CPU and the memory. Okay, so uh, we, we're not looking at the other components yet, uh, perhaps at a later stage, time permitting. So um, now let's focus in on the memory itself. Okay. Now, the memory uh, can comprise of, um, of the address itself and the actual contents of the memory, okay? So um, you can think of this as, um, as a shelf, as um, maybe something, a uh, filing cabinet, and the filing cabinet uh, may have, let's say, several shelves, and this could be shelf number one, this is number two, this is number three, and inside the contents of that shelf is, you know, you may have some files in it, okay? So this is the contents of that address, and this is the address. So this is the address number zero, and this is the contents of that. So the, the contents could be, for example, zero three. So the address, for example, if it's four bits long, then the question over here is, what is the maximum memory that you can address with a four bit address, okay? So that should hopefully be clear that if you have a four bits for the address, then, and this is in hex, okay? So I'm writing everything in hex over here. Uh, this would be 0000, zero, zero, zero and this would be in binary, it would be 0001 zero, 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 and 0010 zero, 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 and so on. So if you have four bits for the address, then the maximum uh, address addressing bit would be an F in hex, okay, using a single nibble. And so the maximum memory that you could address would be 16, okay, going all the way from zero up till 15, okay? And this goes back from our earlier lecture where we had introduced the hexadecimal notation, okay? So um, if you've understood, and of course the contents could be, you know, we don't really know what these contents could be. These could be random. If, you're if you just turned on your computer, um, these could be random or they may be from an earlier time period, okay? So um, if you've understood this, um, what would be the maximum memory addressable by a one byte address? So let's say that now, instead of using four bits for the address, I use one byte for the address. Okay, that's two nibbles. So what would be the maximum addressable memory that we could address with, four, with, two byte, with one byte or two nibbles? Okay, this is sort of like saying um, we're using two bytes to address the, the shelf number. And the shelf number, let's say, goes from, let's say, zero to one to two. So if you're only using two bytes, uh, sorry, if you're only using one byte to specify the address of the shelf, what's the maximum number of shelves that you could have in your filing cabinet? Anybody? Uh, two to the uh, power eight uh, yeah. bytes. Okay. Right. So it would be two to power eight, and what would that so be? So two fifty six, I believe. Two hundred fifty six, right? So the addresses would go, as you notice over here, the addresses are going from zero to F, which is all ones, one, 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 one. Okay. So um, the the address over here would go to F F, and if you recall, an F F is basically, um, well, it's a whole bunch of ones. Okay, there'll be eight ones, okay? And this would correspond to, how would we figure out whether this is 256? Well, 
If you remember, the first bit corresponds to 2 to the power 0, 2 to the power 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So um, if you do the calculation, uh, this should be able to give you 255. Okay. Or a simpler way to do it is in hex notation. F is a 15. So if you remember your hex multiplication, it's 15 times 16 plus this is also 15. So you have 15 times 16 plus 15, and that would give you 255. Okay. So the addressing would basically go from zero to 255. So in other words, uh, you could have 256 bytes of memory. Uh, if you had more than that, um, if you had more than 255, 256 bytes of memory, then the one byte address would not be sufficient to be able to address that uh, location, okay? This is like saying that uh, I'm using a piece of paper and I've only got space uh, to write, let's say a single number, single digit, okay? I can write zero till nine. So let's suppose that we're doing it in, in decimal. So if, if I've only got a single, uh, if I've only got space over here to write a single digit, then clearly the maximum space that I can have uh, the maximum number of shells that I can address would be from zero to nine. And they, um, that would imply that you have a um, total of 10 shells, okay? So uh, a lot of times you have to think about these things. For example, um, if IBA introduces um, uh, a, new, a new numbering scheme for all the rooms at IBA, okay? And we, we think that, well, the maximum number of rooms that we're going to have at IBA is going to be 99, okay? So zero to 99. So we could say, well, I'm just going to use two, uh, two digit space on the doors to address the room number, okay? So I'm going to start off with 0, 1, 0, 2, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, and so on until I get to 1, 0, and then I'll go up till all the way up to 99. Now, this piece of um, uh, this room number if in case we go, we have more faculty members or we have more people than 100, then what is the problem going to be? We're basically going to have a problem in which we don't have enough space on, on the board, uh, which has the room numbers to be able to actually specify the 101st room number, okay? And then we might have to change all the room numbering schemes so that we actually have extra space over here for every room number. And now if we have three digits, and we're using the decimal numbers, then we can go up to 999. So then we would go up to 10 to power three, okay? So this is essentially saying that your address space determines the amount of memory that you can actually have in your computer, okay? Is that concept clear to everybody? And um, let's, uh, to further check that, let's take a look at, um, and this was simply the, the previous example. So this is going from zero to F and the actual contents could be different, okay? And if you have a one byte memory, then we have 255, zero to 255 um, bytes of memory could be addressable, okay? So if you've understood that, let's try to see if you can answer this question. So uh, you might have heard of 32-bit computers and 64-bit computers, okay? People who've uh, been buying computers uh, might be you know, familiar with this. Computers or, or operating systems as they refer to generally are either 32-bit or 64-bit. You don't have 128-bit normally, but you might have uh, observed that your computer is actually either 32-bit or 64-bit. Now, what that means is that the addressing capability of your computer is either 32 bits, okay, or it's going to be 64 bits. So if you have a 32-bit computer, it basically means that the address space over here is 32 bits, okay? So if your address space is 32 bits, what's the maximum amount of memory that you can have in your computer? Right, and F, 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 so. How much is that, sorry? Uh, value-wise, 1795. 
Uh, Heather, I'm not able to quite get you. If you can speak up a little bit. What is the answer going to be? So I was saying that the address in hexadecimal maximum would be four, it's four bytes, right? So F, 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 and F. Okay, very good. So the, it would be uh, F, 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 F. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Anybody disagrees with this? Four bytes. Is this one byte or is this two bytes? This is hexadecimal. Remember, this is a nibble. Each one of these is a nibble. So should it be eight Fs? Yes. So there's going to be eight Fs. Okay. Why is that? Because these two Fs together is are one byte. And this is the second byte, this is the third byte, and this is the fourth byte. So if this is the case, then what is the maximum? amount of memory that you can have in your computer. The two is to the power of 32. Very good. Four so gigabytes. Two to the power of 32, and somebody has just answered that, that's four gigabytes. Okay. Now, how did, uh, by the way, who said four gigabytes, and how did you calculate that so quickly? Sir, uh, Omar Ahmad. Ji, Omar. Sir, uh, two to the power of 32, as there are 32 bits in a system, Mm -hmm. So uh, we calculated by multiplying, powering it to the power of 32. That would be uh, around, the answer would be around, we need to calculate it using calculator. Okay, but somebody already answered four gigabytes. So did you actually punch that into the computer? Did you already know that? Or you have a, a, me a method to be able to calculate this? Usually when we buy computers, so the shopkeepers tell us this. Okay. Yeah, but let's not rely on the average shopkeeper in, in Karachi or anywhere else. Uh, so let's do something more uh, interesting. So uh, I'll tell you a shortcut to do, to do this. Um, if you don't know this already, uh, basically two to the power 10 corresponds to 1000. It's actually 1024. But approximately this can be thought of as 10 to the power 3. Okay. Two to the power 20 is then 10 to the power three to the power of two. Two to the power 30 is 10 to the power three to the power of three, okay? Two to the power 40 would be 10 to the power of nine. Sorry, 10 to the power of 12, okay? So this is 10 to the power of nine. This is 10 to the power of six, okay? So um, if you're looking at two to the power 32, this can simply be written as two to the power two multiplied by two to the power 30. This is going to be from here, is going to be 10 to the power nine, which is one gigabyte or 10 to the power nine bytes, okay? So if you give me any number, let's do this in a, in a few minutes. So you have this, right? This is four gigabyte. Um, and you don't really have to memorize what I just told you. It's just a shortcut. Uh, since you're all computer science students, uh, you may be running into these calculations um, as you go forward. So let's do this calculation. Uh, what about 64 bits? How much memory could you actually have in your computer if you have 64 bits uh, in your, if, if you have a 64 bit computer? In other words, the address bit is going to be 64 bits, okay? And now you can imagine how many Fs you're going to have over here. The maximum is going to be F, F all the way up till here. And this is going to be one, two, and it's going to be eight bytes. Okay, so 16 Fs. So um, what would this number here be? Two to the power 64. To the power 64, yes. and can somebody use this methodology to be able to tell me what that number will be as a binary two decimal number? So it'll be two terabytes. Okay, now what's a terabyte? So tell me in terms of 10 to the power something. Okay, so let's keep going on. This is two to the power 40, two to the power 50, two to the power 60. So this is going to be 10 to the power 12. This is going to be what? 10 to the power 15, 10 to the power 18, okay? 
And so two to the power 64 can be written as two to the power four times two to the power 60. So that two to the power four is clearly 16, right? And two to the power 60 is going to be 10 to the power 18. Okay, so this is a huge number. Okay, uh, I think this sorry, is. Sorry, is that like sixteen picabytes? Uh, that's actually what is called an exabyte. Okay, so an exabyte, if you remember, um, you don't have to uh, know this, but if you remember from one of our earlier lectures, an exabyte is ten. To I remember. 18. Okay, so it's ten to the eighteen. It's a new 18. notation. Yeah. So uh, this is, well, I've written down this 18 exabytes um, to the power four, okay. eight, yeah, so this is actually eight, it's, it's, yeah, it's approximately 16 or 18. Okay, the reason why it's 18 is because um, there's a slight difference in terms, it's actually 1024, okay, not 1000, so it becomes, but to get an approximate idea of the size, you can see that our calculation was pretty accurate, okay? 16 uh, exabytes or 16 times 10 to the power 18 bytes, okay? So um, the reason for this calculation is just to show you how this can be easily calculated, okay? So, uh, uh, so this gives you an idea of what is an address and what is uh, the actual contents of the memory. So the contents of the memory for each one of these contents you could have different values. So the content of 0, 1, 0, 2, and so on could be different values. It could be 0, 5 over here. It could be a, a 1 over here and so on. Uh, but this is the address of that, okay? So you have to differentiate between the address of a memory location and the actual contents of that, okay? Very fundamental difference. I hope everybody is clear about this. Uh, if not, this is the time to ask. Okay, let's go on. So this was the actual example that I showed you. Uh, so a 32-bit computer would have would only be able to have four gigabytes. Now, at one time, 32-bit computers were the rage. You know, uh, four gigabytes seemed to be a lot of memory. But today, as you know, four gigabytes is nothing. You need you have terabytes of data um, in your in your computer. Although in RAM, actually, four gigabytes is still quite a lot. So, but today you know that we all have uh, eight gigabytes, 16 gigabytes of RAM. So a 32-bit computer would not be able to have, uh, would not be able to address, or you wouldn't have the capability to, to actually add that much memory. So you definitely need to have 64-bit computers today, okay? So now, now that you've understood what a memory is uh, and its memory location, let's now look at the relationship between, as I said earlier, that you've got something called a bus, okay? Um, and the bus connects the, the CPU to the memory, okay? And uh, let's take a look at how a bus operates. Now, I'm going to refer to a bus as follows. So a bus is, you can think of it as a, a single bus can be thought of as a single piece of wire, okay? But in most, uh, and we'll look at this uh, later on as well, uh, there are two types of communications. There's something called serial communications and there's parallel communications, okay? And we're just going to look at parallel communications right now. In other words, if you want to, for example, specify uh, a particular memory location. So you, for example, you're looking at memory location zero, zero, um, all the way till one, okay? So the way you would specify it on a bus is that you would say, um, you would have eight pieces of wires, eight separate wires. These are called parallel buses. And these eight wires would physically uh, be shown this way. But in shorthand notation, we're going to just show it in this notation, okay? In other words, if I write 16 over here, this actually means that there are 16 separate wires uh, physically on the, on, the actual hard, on the actual motherboard, okay? The 16 wires connecting these two. So, um, can people please mute themselves? Okay. So um, now let's take a look at a at difference between an address bus and a, a data bus. Okay. Um, 
So let's assume, let's take a look at the previous case where we're saying that your you have a computer which only has a single byte as the address space. So what would this be called? Um, 64-bit computer, 32-bit computer, 8-bit computer, 1-bit computer, what would you call it? If it only has one byte for the address space. 8-bit. Yeah, so this would be an 8-bit computer, okay? And the actual example that we're going to look at, a fictitious example that we're going to look at that's in the book is going to use to be based on an 8-bit computer, okay? Just so that we can understand the concepts. So let's think about an 8-bit computer. And um, let's say that we, what we're trying to do, the C, what the CPU is trying to do is it's, going, it's trying to write something to this location. How it does that, we'll look, figure out later on. But the way it's going to do it is it's going to say, well, I want to give the address over here. So let's say that I, I want to the, write the, um, the contents 05 to the address location of 01. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify on these eight bits, the value zero one in hex. Okay, so that's going to be zero, 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 one. Okay, on each one of these eight lines, one of them is going to be one, the rest of them are going to carry the signal zero. Okay, so the address bus is going to specify the address of the memory, and you're going to write the contents of that on the data bus. Okay, and the data bus is shown as, uh, as uh, going in both directions because you might want to at times write and also read from the memory. So let's assume that you're trying to write to the memory. So over here, let's say if you're trying to, uh, in, in the address location zero one, you're trying to write the contents zero five, the number five. So what you're going to do is you're going to specify zero five over here. And I normally put a line across uh, when I write zero versus an O because this could be confused with an O as opposed to zero. So it's just my personal notation. So a zero five is going to be put on the data bus. Why? Because that's the, the contents we want to write into the memory location. The memory location is going to be specified by the address bus, okay? So you can see that the total number of lines the total number of physical wires connecting the CPU and the RAM memory are going to be eight plus a total of 16 physical parallel lines, okay? And using this, you can actually write the number five into a particular location, okay? So if you want to write the number, let's say uh, zero 06 uh, into address location zero 02, what would we do? Well, we'd simply put the address 02 over here, okay, on the address bus, and we're going to put the, uh, the number 06 on the data bus. Now, vice versa, if we, let's say, wanted to read the, look, the contents of address FF, and let's assume that this is the number 04, then what are we going to do? We're going to put the address FF over here, and somehow we're going to indicate using some other technique that we want to read from this location. So the contents of this location are going to be fed into the CPU, okay? And this 04 is going to be now read from the memory, okay? Um, so that in a very, uh, at a very high level is what is the operation of the bus on the, on the computer, the CPU and the memory, okay? So uh, I'm going to be slowly going into more and more details, but I'm trying to give you the 30,000 foot view initially, and then we're going to sort of, sort of keep going deeper and deeper into the computer's architecture. But you have to be able to understand the view at the high level before you can actually go down to the low level, okay? So any questions so far about how this is operating? Okay, if not, let's keep going. Uh, sir. Uh, one question. Uh, sir, how does, uh, all right, so basically in order for something, for some kind of byte to be saved in the memory, does the address bus and the and the data bus have to be synchronized? As in how, how, do, how does it exactly happen? Okay, we put six, we put six byte in uh, the second, in the zero to address. Okay, so um, you, you mentioned something about 
I think you mentioned synchronization, okay? So that's going to be much later on. But let's try to understand things step by step and uh, just try to understand at a very high level what's going on. And the low level, we'll, we'll discuss those as you go forward, okay? So you Can just you have to be that? a little patient, all right? Yeah. But at yeah. the highest yeah. level, all we're doing is that the CPU is using the address bus to specify the address of the memory and using the data bus to actually carry the actual contents, either to read from the memory or to the right, okay? So that's all that you need to understand so far as to what you have covered. And how the details come out um, will come come uh, across slowly. Okay. So is everybody okay. clear on the concept of the address bus and versus the data bus, and the concept of the okay. RAM, the memory address of the RAM, and the CPU? Okay. So I keep need to mute people. So let's go on. Um, Okay, so this was a um, question over here that I had was that if let's say you had 32 bits, this was a single, uh, this was an eight bit computer. Now, if you have a 32 bit computer, all right, uh, what would be the size of the address bus versus the data bus? So uh, earlier, the, these two were the same. They were both one byte. The address was also uh, one byte and the contents were also one byte. Now let's assume that you have a 32-bit computer, okay? So in a 32-bit computer, how many, what should be the size of the address bus? Same marketing. Sorry, go ahead. Four bytes. Yeah, so it should be, well, it won't be in terms of bytes, but it will be basically 32 parallel lines, okay? So uh, it would not be appropriate to say four bytes because Bytes is generally a notation for uh, memory, memory storage, okay? So the storage is generally given in terms of bytes, okay? But the address can be thought of as in terms of bits. But I, I won't uh, consider it as a wrong answer, but uh, it would be more appropriate to think of it as 32 separate lines or 32 bits in the address field, okay? So 32 bits, but what about the contents? Will the contents still be one byte? So it, can the data bus be eight bits or does it have to be 32 bits also? Should be eight bits. Okay, um, that's fine, okay. When would you, you think that you may have a problem with this? And this is sort of an advanced question, but if nobody gets it, we'll come back to it, okay? But uh, yes, so the address bus and the data bus can have different sizes, okay? That simply depends on how big is your address field. Okay, and if all you're trying to do is read and write single bytes from the memory at a given time, then eight bits is enough. But if you're trying to read two bytes simultaneously from the memory, then do you, what do you think should be the size of the data bus? Uh, sir, Omar Ahmad here. Yeah, Omar. Sir, the size of the data bus determine the data transfer rate. So if the data transfer will be very slow, so we need to increase the width of the data bus. Yeah, okay, very well. But so basically, if, if you're trying to get two bytes uh, starting from the location zero, zero, you're trying to get two bytes from the memory simultaneously, then clearly eight bits would not work very well because you'd have to do it in two, um, in two cycles, as you can say. First time you'd actually get the first eight bits and then you'd get the contents of the of address one, okay? But if, you, if this was 16 bits, then you could actually get the contents of both of these bytes simultaneously, okay? So essentially by having broader data bus, you can actually speed things up, okay? And we'll look at more examples of this as we go forward. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't you have to have two address buses for that as well? Okay, so if you're trying to get uh, non-contiguous location, so for example, if you're trying to get the address of 00 and 02 uh, at the same time, then you would then very well put, you would need to have two addresses, okay? But let's say that you're trying to get contiguous space, okay? So you're trying to get a four, a two bytes starting from address zero. So it would get, so it would simply use the first byte from the, the first address, and then it would increment it 
and get the second byte from the second address. This is sort of like in the filing cabinet, you say, well, I not only need to have the location of address N, but I also need to have the address, the contents of, the, of both of these shelves. So I'm going to have, an, um, I'm simply going to specify the first address and the second address is simply going to be the next one. And I want all of this to be given to me. So I need to have somebody having two trolleys in a sense. So they're going to transfer two shelves worth of contents from the files from the filing cabinet simultaneously. Okay. So this is like, you know, the contents of the filing cabinet coming to you. Okay. So I hope that is clear. So um, as you saw earlier in this example, you could have 32 and eight bits. Um, now, earlier I had shown that the CPU is sort of a black box, okay? And we looked at the bus and we looked at the main memory. Now let's come down from the 30,000 foot level and slightly lower down. And let's try to focus in on the actual CPU, okay? So the CPU is shown over here as comprising of three components. And this is figure 2.1 from the book PNB, okay? Um, and um, let's try to now understand the different components of the CPU, okay? So the first thing that I'm going to look at, um, well, let's look at the registers. The registers are fairly simple, okay? So each one of these register is sort of like a memory, okay? So if you can think of as the, your one byte memory, and you take it out and you put it on your CPU, uh, that can be thought of as a register, okay? Now, you might ask, why do we need to duplicate the main memory onto the CPU itself, okay? This, the short answer is that uh, if you have memory on the CPU, then uh, it becomes easier to access. This is sort of like, you know, I gave you the example of your desk, okay? So you have desk and you have a filing cabinet. Now, the early example that I gave you was the hard disk and your RAM, okay? But now uh, you can think of the RAM being your filing cabinet and your registers being your desk space, okay? So if you have something on your desk, obviously it can be accessed a lot faster. You don't have to go through a bus. So you can think of this as a trolley, somebody going and fetching it from main memory, that becomes fairly slow, okay? If you have it right inside the same chip, this is your separate chips, remember, okay? You don't have to go through a bus to be able to access it. And so the registers become a lot faster to be able to manipulate data. So these are the registers and these could be any number of registers. Now, the, let's next take a look at what is an arithmetic logic unit or what is referred to as an ALU, okay? So um, an ALU essentially is something that uh, we've already seen before. It's uh, simply some combinational logic, okay? Uh, it's generally represented by this uh, inverted A, you might call it. And you can think of it as having two inputs, okay? And these could be A and B, and it will have one output, okay? And you may try to perform different operations, okay? So the kind of operations that you can perform is addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, et cetera, okay? How do you ask the ALU to perform these operations is using this particular signal, okay? So the op code or the operational code um, determines whether you're going to either do an addition over here, you're going to add these two numbers. So if let's say the op code is for example, zero one, that is supposed to be an addition, so what it's going to do is the output is going to be A plus B, okay? If the opcode is zero two, let's say that stands for subtract, then what it's going to do is the output is going to be A minus B, okay? If the opcode is zero three, then it's going to do A multiplied by B and so on, okay? So uh, these are different operational codes that are going to control the ALU, okay? So um, have you seen something like this before? Um, in some of the last lectures, can somebody tell me some combinational logic which was doing this or sequential logic? And the logic is. The, the, uh, yeah, so what example did we see before? 
Uh, yeah, two bit and three bit address. Yeah. So two bit, two bit address. So th- basically, this is what we saw last time. Is that this is essentially the add function if you want to do a two bit addition. Okay. So um, this essentially this uh, combinational logic. Remember, this is not sequential. This is combinational. The output purely depends on the inputs. There's no memory here. So this, lo- all of this logic would be inside the ALU. Now, would this? So now, do you think the logic for addition would be different from subtraction? The combination logic versus multiplication and division. Yeah, it's going to be clearly different. it has to be because we know that when we we adding the truth table for addition will be different from the truth table for subtraction and multiplication and so on. Okay, so essentially what you'll have inside the ALU is a whole bunch of these circuits. And then which circuit is actually used will depend on the opcode itself. So it's going to be some fancy combinational logic, okay? And it's going to become more and more complex depending on how many types of uh, opcodes do you have, okay? It will also depend on the size of this integer, okay? So clearly this was just two bits. So this was a single bit, this was a single bit, but that's not very useful. Normally, this would be at least eight bits, okay? So this would be eight bits and this would be eight bits, or it could be 16 bits and so on, okay? So you can imagine that the ALU can be fairly complex, okay? But it's normally, uh, you know, it's whole, it's simply a whole bunch of combination logic which will, in, which will uh, determine what the outputs, given a certain set of inputs, it will determine the output of that, okay? So that was the ALU. So we've understood what registers are and we've understood what ALU are. But who's controlling all of this? Okay, who's providing the opcode and who's telling the computer what to do? Okay, so that is the control unit. Okay, so the control unit is essentially controlling all of this. So um, let's take a look at this example. So let's say that we have a simple operation and we have the CPU, okay? We have the control unit, we have the registers, and we have the ALU, okay? And our objective is to, we want to add two numbers together that are located at address 00 and 01, and we put, want to put the result in address 02, okay? So let's say this is an example, you have an address, so this is an eight bit computer, okay? The address is given by one byte, uh, we want to take the two numbers, uh, the, the, the contents of address 00 is going to be the first number, okay? The content of address 01 is going to be the second number, and we're going to put the result in 02, and it should be the addition operation, okay? So ultimately, what do we want to have over here? In address 02, it's simply going to be these two numbers together, added together, so we should expect this objective to result in um, a 08 being written and hex 08 being written in memory location 02, okay? So um, how are we going to achieve this? So in order to be able to understand this, uh, we have to go slightly lower down, okay? And we've got a few minutes left. I think let's try to take a quick look at how this is going to be done, okay? So what we could do is we could specify a bunch of low level operations, okay? And these are generally called machine level code, okay? What it can do is do very simple operations. Each one of these is called an instruction, okay? An instruction. And each instruction is fairly simple. So here's uh, four instructions which will do this objective, which will be able to achieve this objective. So the first instruction says that load the contents of address 00 into register R0, okay? So for, first, what we're going to do is we're going to load things into the register before we're going to add them, okay? Simply because it's a lot faster to work with the registers than with the memory. So the first uh, instruction is going to be load contents of address 00 into R0. So I'm showing register R0, what's going to be the content over here after this? this particular instruction is executed. Can somebody tell me? Uh, 
Zero three. All right. So, and how was it operated? We would put an address of zero zero over here, and we would say we want to read from the memory. So the contents zero three would go in, and they would somehow get written over here into this register. Okay. Uh, the next uh, instruction is load contents of address zero one into register R one. Okay. So clearly now what's going to happen is you're going to put the address zero one over here, and this contents is going to be read into onto the data bus. Zero five is going to get, be written onto R one, and so this is going to become zero five. Okay. Next, what we are asking the the uh, CPU to do is to add register R0 and R1. So it's going to take both of these. So now it's going to take R0 over here perhaps, and R1 over here. It's going to add both of these, and the output is going to be written to R2, okay? Add R0 and R1 and put it into R2. So, the, so this is what the uh, ALU is going to perform, and the result over here is going to be 0, 08. And finally, we're going to say write R2 to memory location 02. So by memory location, we're referring to the RAM, okay? So this is going to now, um, what's going to happen over here, the address we're going to say is, um, we, we're going to specify the address 02, okay? Because we want to take the register two, and we want to take the contents of that, it's going to be put on the data bus, and this is going to be, put in the memory location zero two, okay? So this is basically at a very high level, this is what we are going to try to achieve, okay? Breaking it, the, the operation down into a sequence of simple steps. And each one of these steps are going to be referred to as machine code.